Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Project Sovereign. Today, I'm with Peter Russell. Peter holds degrees in theoretical physics, experimental psychology, and computer science from Cambridge University. After university, he went to India to study meditation and Eastern philosophy. He's the author of numerous books, including Seeds of Awakening, The Brain Book, From Science to God, and Waking Up in Time. Peter, thank you for joining me on Project Sovereign. Pleasure to be with you. Looking forward to it. So, Peter, uh, I first listened to a lecture of yours, uh, The Primacy of Consciousness. I think that was done in 2011, 2012 sometime. And I've listened to a few yeah. of your talks since then on, on science and non-duality uh, and other, other podcasts. It's rare, although getting more noticeable now, that uh, scientists are merging their expertise in the fields of consciousness and spirituality. It's getting much more common. Can you give us a little bit of background on your life to see how you ended up being a scientist, essentially, at the beginning of your career, to use, it, to use that term, mm -hmm. and then move into the, the field of spirituality? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I started out, my primary interest was in science, uh, mathematics in particular. I was a budding mathematician. I loved mathematics. It, like, it was the, it, to, me, to me, mathematics was the key to the universe. Everything in the physical world ultimately can come down to mathematical expressions in terms of you know, the fundamentals. And so I went to university. I was at Cambridge studying math. And at this stage, I had no interest whatsoever in religion. I, I'd rejected religion as a kid. I think it was at about 13, 14. I was brought up, you know, regular Church of England where we went to church about once a month. That was seen to be good enough for our sins. But you know, the whole village did. That was what you did. I remember going through the process of confirmation. Um, you know, I realized the Nicene Creed you know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, yeah. made of you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> stories like it <laughs> was wasn't just something you chanted in church. It was actually a creed. You were meant yeah. to sign off on it. It was a belief system you were meant to sign off on. And I thought, mm. I can't sign off on this. And I told my parents, you know, I'm, and they said that, you know, they were they were fairly liberal in their own way. I remember years, years later, years later, probably fifty years later, my mother confided in me. She said. I never really believed in it myself either. <laughs> so I, I rejected religion at that stage. And um, so, this, so that was my sort of, that's where I was. But then I started, I was always interested in the mind, in, in consciousness in various ways and what the mind was. And even at school, I was, you know, having debates with fellow, you know, kids at school about the mind-body problem was we knew it then, that sort of thing. And so the interest was always there. And that led me to start getting interested in meditation as a way of basically um, changing consciousness. And so I got interested in meditation. And as I got deeper and deeper into meditation, I realized there was something to spirituality after all. There was, there was a common element to all the world's spiritual traditions which got dressed up in different ways and became religions, which looked totally different and would argue about with each other about which one was right. But they were arguing about the doctrines and dogmas and all that sort of clothing that had been put on the essential wisdom. And I got fascinated by what is the essence here. And it seemed to me to be something around, put it very, very simply, that we get caught in a limited mode of consciousness. You call it the materialistic mode or a self-centered mode, but we're functioning at limited potential. And all the traditions in one way or another had practices which were designed to free the mind, to step back from our material, materialism, to get more in touch with our deeper self. And so that's really how I became interested in, in spirituality which for me is, is really the, the personal exploration of our own consciousness. So that's how I see spirituality, personal exploration of basically who we are, what's going on in here, how we get caught and things. Mm. And seeing, and you know, then I became interested in religion, not for you know, following any particular path, but more seeing how that basic wisdom was there in all the traditions. Mm. Mm. And... How do you see science today, and particularly materialist science? Do you hold that in high regard, or, or do you 
think that it's got a lot of problems that it needs to overcome? Um, basically, I hold it in high, high regard. Um, but yeah, I don't know how high, but yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, just to say, I don't see a conflict between science and spirituality. We can get into that more in a bit. Um, I don't see a conflict. I mean, science is the exploration of, you know, how the world out there works, um, how it functions. That is, that's what it's studying. And it makes mistakes. It has hypotheses. It makes mistakes. But it's always forming new, new understandings, new models. And so it's, it's an evolving. It's an evolving system of knowledge, really. And, you know, we can see how much it's evolved just over the last 100 years in terms of, you know, quantum physics coming online and things like that and, mm. you know, molecular biology. So it's an evolving field. But the one, there is one limitation to modern science today to, the, you know, the materialist science, which studies only the outer physical world. It cannot explain why we are conscious. Mm. And that that's its fundamental limitation it can explain you know why everything else goes on or why it thinks it does you know and how stars evolve and how cells work and all that stuff mm -hmm. but it says nothing about the fact that we are conscious experiencing beings and yet paradoxically all of science takes place in the mind mm -hmm. you know we do the experiments out there but our understanding the hypotheses, the conclusions we come to, the models of the world are all in the mind. So in a way, the mind is absolutely essential to science. And yet science doesn't ignores it. And so this, this to me is the big paradox of the contemporary materialistic worldview. It, it's great at explaining what's going on out there mm. with limitations. And it just falls silent when it comes to consciousness. I mean, most scientists would be much happier if there was no such thing as consciousness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it, it's a huge enigma. And, that, and when you get an enigma like this, it's the sign there's something fundamentally wrong with the paradigm. Um, mm. you know, the classic case was, well, several classic cases, but one I think most people relate to is the Copernican Revolution when before that the model of the solar system was the earth was at the center of the universe and everything went around the earth and there were lots of problems with that and they kept on fudging it and adding bits and trade changing bits to keep up this essential assumption that the earth was the center of the universe and copernicus came along and said no no look hang on maybe the sun is the center of the solar system we go around the sun which was anathema at the time and he got told to shut up by the church. But that's the, the, there was something wrong with the old paradigm. And now, you know, a new paradigm, which is basically a model, has emerged, and we all accept it as the fact that the earth goes around the sun. Although, interestingly enough, in our experience, we still see the sun going around the earth. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we look at the sun rising and going round. So we still see it that way, but our understanding has shifted. Mm. so i think we're in a similar situation but almost in a much larger way that the problem with the modern scientific worldview is it as i say it doesn't it doesn't account for consciousness and so there's something fundamentally missing there so i think we have to in some way move towards a scientific view of the world that includes consciousness as fundamental in some way or other mm. I think maybe the fear of the study of consciousness would leave science obsolete, maybe. Would there be any need for science if it got to that understanding? Oh, I think so. Um, I think it's about expanding science. I think all that science is discovering and will discover about the physical world mm. is, will still be valid. It's, I think it's a really valid approach to that. But it needs to expand its scope to also understanding consciousness and by understanding consciousness i don't mean just you know putting electrodes on the brain and seeing yeah. what's happening in the brain when, mm. when we have a dream or when we imagine something that's still you know very materialistic approach it's still you know looking at the brain as a physical organism mm. the way you understand consciousness i think is what the you know the spiritual adepts monks yogis people have done is 
you explore it firsthand. And that's a different sort of scientific approach. But I think it, still be, it can still be scientific in its methodology. And, and maybe there's a distinction we should draw here between the methodology of science, the practice of science, and the current paradigm. The practice, you know, as it's classically put out, is there's, there's observation, there's hypothesis, there's experimentation, you draw conclusions. And that practice goes on, even though the conclusions we draw may change over time. So I think you can put that methodology to work with our own consciousness. We can actually, we can observe, you know, just take a simple example, we can observe that when the mind becomes quieter, we have certain, certain feelings change. We could form a hypothesis about, you know, if, if I did a certain sort of practice, then I might discover something or other about my own self. And we mm. do the practice and we discover, oh, yes, you know, I feel a certain level of joy when I do this practice. And other people do it and they say, yes, I do too. So then you have a sort of a corroboration, which is in science. I mean, in science, you publish in order to get other people to see whether you're right. Mm. Mm. And I would say the mystics, you know, I would just call them the mystics generally, you know, they've published in lots of different ways, you know, books and talks and things. Mm. And they all seem to basically agree on something. So there's an agreement here about, just put it loosely, the way consciousness works. But it's, it's through a subjective experimentation, mm. which of course mm. science doesn't like because you can't measure it. Science yeah. wants to measure things, but that's because it's studying the measurable, the physically measurable world. Yeah, the linear domain, yeah. What, do you believe the mind to be a receiver or a transmitter of, of this con of this stuff, consciousness stuff? Um, neither. No. Um, I don't believe there's a consciousness stuff, as you put it. Um, mm. and I think this is part of the problem with when science does look at consciousness, it treats consciousness as some thing to be looked at. It's interesting when you... I mean, if you take the word consciousness, it, N-E-S-S, when you add N-E-S-S to any noun, you're basically taking an adjective mm. and turning it into an abstract noun in order to talk about it. Mm. So, you know, happiness is the, the state of being happy. But, and we all know what being happy is like, but happiness itself doesn't exist. It's just, it's just a term we use, or mm. you know, redness is a colour. Yeah. We all know what the experience of red is. Redness doesn't exist. And it's, I think it's the same with consciousness. Consciousness is not a thing in itself. It's just a term we use to talk about the fact that we are all aware. We are all conscious beings. So for me, the word just refers to the fact that I am, I am conscious, to put it simply. I am conscious, which is... It's, it's universal to my life. I mean, everything that I experience or know is something appearing in my consciousness mm. that I am conscious of, whether it's you know, dreams or feelings or the tree outside. It's all an experience in my, con in my consciousness. So I'm just using consciousness in that loose way. But the problem is when we start looking, oh, what is consciousness? I think we're off on a wrong track. Mm. It's, it's more pointing to it's universal, undeniable fact that mm. I am an experiencing being. Mm. If we so I don't think, just come back to your question, I don't think the mind is a receiver or transmitter of consciousness. The mind is the mind is conscious. The mind is conscious, and in that experiences appear. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so if we if we would put consciousness would could we consider then consciousness as everything at that point and subjectively the uh, uh uh subjective awareness is the same as the consciousness itself or could that be considered the same thing yes yes i'm i'm you hear my caution um <laughs> it's, it's easy to sort of to get i get i get picky over words yes um, yes i understand and I think it's important. It's, well, there's one question. I mean, 
the conscious consciousness is is universal in a sense that how it feels to me to be conscious i suspect is how it is for you what you are conscious of is very different you know you've had your own life your own experiences you're in a different physical location so what appears in my mind and i'm using mind in the sense of the whole um three-dimensional multi-sensory appearance that i'm living in is different from yours but the underlying being conscious is universal mm, mm. um but we're, we're, sorry go back to your question what, what were you you're heading for something or uh, looking for something that's a good point i can't actually remember what i asked now i think it was can we could we um consider our subjective awareness our consciousness right. field could we consider that as the same, for example, as your consciousness, you say it's universal. Yeah. Is it infinite? Is it everythingness? Okay. Yeah. 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 That's the point. So there's two steps to this. There's one, which is, I mean, philosophically, it's what's called epistemology. Is mm. how how do we know what we know? Um, the study of the study of how we know. And in that sense, I would say yes it is universal to our experience mm -hmm. then then this question which we and we get the two confused a bit is what in philosophy is called ontology which is the study of the thing in itself the world out there that um it's easy to say or oh, therefore consciousness is the essence of everything in the world i don't know that we can make that statement i think we must remain agnostic on that um, and this is, I mean, what Immanuel Kant did, the, you know, one of the early idealist philosophers 200 years ago, he said, all we ever know is our experience. And we, you know, we know there is something out there, but we can never know it directly. And therefore we can't really say much about it. So, I mean, I used to, again, you've been, you know, watching my earlier videos. <laughs> I used to really go in that direction of, the ontology and, and can still argue that everything that consciousness is fundamental to everything not mm. i mean not just human beings obviously animals dogs you know where do you draw the line you can't draw a line ultimately you have to say consciousness it, there's always that sort of element of consciousness there mm. um and i and then a few years ago i really stopped i stopped stop talking about that or thinking about it because i just came to this point of what do i know I, I could argue my position fairly well and debate with others on this matter and you know know that my view was better than their view and i just realized it was getting into another ego game yeah sure really. yeah. Like, yeah. i understand you know i know what's really going on and i can argue <laughs> that consciousness is fundamental to everything and you have got it and i thought it, it doesn't really matter it, whether consciousness or not is fundamental for everything is just an it's an intellectual game well, i think mm. what is where what what i realize is what's really important is to know that you and i share that same basic fundamental consciousness and all other human beings do and you know deep down we're all looking for the same thing in a way how to reconnect with that fundamental nature and that to me these days is the more important thing because that's that affects how we um how we relate to each other and how we can um free ourselves from you know where we started you know the materialistic short-sighted self-centered way of thinking mm -hmm. so, so that's what i am these days it's like the other stuff you know what the world is like and whether rocks have consciousness or what degree of consciousness is is fascinating stuff but it's like counting angels on the head of a pin thing mm -hmm. so uh, you, you mentioned something there that i'd like to pick up on do, um do you consider everybody's suffering the, the same they're trying to f find that fundamental nature that they're looking for which is i think the words that you use there do you think yeah. everybody's suffering is based around that they've lost that sense of yes right yes uh, again we have to i think qualify it a bit 
this is not to say you know we don't have pain mm. um, we do, um, and a lot of people are in very you know unfortunate circumstances um, which there may be you know, not just physical pain but emotional pain um, but there's an old saying that you know pain is inevitable suffering is optional yeah. and what that's pointing out is suffering in a way is the layer we put on top of it you know oh, i i wish this weren't there i'm suffering because i wish this pain weren't there whatever it is um you see suffering as i see it is basically discontent discontent in one way or another with what is happening in the moment and that you know as i say if it's if it's extreme pain that discontent is you know it's it's mm. real it, mm. it's not that it it's not that the suffering isn't real, but it comes from a layer that we put on top of what is going on, the discontent. Mm. And that, you know, I think that's what Buddha was getting at. You know, people say, oh, Buddha said life is suffering. And then they sort of interpret that as, therefore, we just got to get on with the fact that life is suffering. <laughs> yeah. he, he wasn't really saying, he was saying we all suffer, but the word he used in Pali, his language, was dukkha which has been translated as suffering and got translated, I think, the way, you know, a couple hundred years ago when earnest European scholars went out east and started discovering these whole new religions, whole new cultures with whole yeah. new languages and got fascinated. And the word suffering sort of got stuck on the word dukkha in Buddhism. The root meaning of it is actually a negation of sukha, which means not feeling at ease. So right. suffering, that I think is a much better term. So when he said, you know, we all suffer, it's, he's basically saying we all feel uneasy, we all feel discontent, we're, we're not at ease most of the time. And that a lot of that discontent, feeling of unease, comes from the thinking, that the, the layers we're putting on top of it. And so you can... I mean, you know, he, he was talking about clinging to how we think things should be. And when we let go of that frame of thought, let go of that clinging, then we can actually come back to being at ease in ourself. Mm. And I think that being at ease in ourself is, I would say that's what our true nature is. Our true nature is one of being at ease. Um, yeah, being at ease is a nice neutral way of putting it. Mm. And then mm. lots of things happen in the world that cause us to feel discontent. And some of the things we can do something about, um, like if it's if it's raining outside, I, I put on, you know, suitable clothing so I don't feel, you know, wet and discontent. I mean, that's a simple <laughs> example. But the point is, a lot of the discontent comes in our mind. We, we start imagining oh, what would happen if I said this to somebody and, oh, they're going to do this, or what happened yesterday? I didn't like what, you know. So we're continually creating discontent in our minds. And I think that's the primary cause of a lot of our suffering. And could so you cons where... Could you consider that like resistance to what is? Absolutely. Resistance to what is, yes. Yeah. Mm. In fact, I mean, it's like, interesting you point that out because... If you go back to even a deeper root meaning of the word dukkha, it's, I say it's the negation of the word sukha, means not at ease. And the word sukha originally, one of the original meanings of it was a wheel that revolves smoothly around its axle, ah. which back then was, you know, really important because the wheel was a new technology. Mm. So it's like there's no resistance to the flow. So being at ease is there's no resistance to the flow. So and not being at ease, our discontent is really not not going with the flow. It's wishing wishing things were different. Mm. So I think that is where the the suffering comes in. It's the wishing things were different, other than they are. Yeah, yeah. Do you consider as we spiritually evolve ourselves? Do you think that that becomes easier for people, like being able to live in the uncertainty? of life because i see a lot particularly the last 12 months or so with everything that's gone on in the planet a lot of the problems that people are facing right now is that they don't know what's going to happen next and they can't handle not knowing 
Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, do you think that, that that's like being able to handle uncertainty or being able to just live with it peacefully within yourself? Is that one of the like keys to like a happy life? I know people search for happiness. It's fleeting. It comes yep. and goes, but do you think that that's a, a fair point to make? Yes. And again, I've qualified. I mean, we're all looking to be happy. I mean, that many people, teachers have said this, you know, the fundamental goal of life is to be happy, to be more at ease, to be at peace. We put different words on it. And actually, can I remind me again the question? I was, is this? Uh, I, I said, um, the last 12 months or so, what's going on? People like yeah, not yeah, being able yeah, to yeah. handle uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is where some form of practice comes in that um, and for that's usually some form of meditation where we can allow the thinking mind, the mind, you know, creates discontent. We can allow that to quieten down. And when it quietens down, we become more, more in touch with that inner ease and equanimity. Mm. And so through that practice, we know we know we begin to experience it's possible to feel more at ease mm. in certain circumstances by letting go of how our clinging our attachment and then we can begin to take that into life and so when we find ourselves getting caught up in you know not knowing what's going to happen and worrying about the future we can sort of say uh -uh, okay there i go again let me just step back from that and begin to touch into that you know, quality of inner quietness in the middle of it so that we're, at, we're able to step back from the worry and find it in ease. So it's more of a practical thing rather than it's not so much accepting the uncertainty, it's being able to, to step out of the uncertainty, the thinking about the uncertainty so that we can come back to our own beingness. So that it's a, it's a way of, but well, that's how I see it anyway. And that's how, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you what do you think the role of psychology is today in in relation to spirituality? Do you consider them the similar things? Because obviously, psyche, if you look at the etymology of the word, that means breath. So we're not yeah. far off there. Do you do you consider them similar topics? They overlap. Mm. They overlap, and. Um, I mean, psychology is, you know, largely how we as individuals function. And when you get into more the therapeutic side of psychology, how we can, you know, learn to undo or live with some of our conditioning that gets in the way, etc. So in that sense, in that sense, they're parallel. And in terms of spirituality and meditation, as I say, you know, we can allow the mind to quieten down and we can discover, you know, our true nature, that sense of ease. But pretty quickly, we're caught up again in the world. And a lot of that comes from habits, but past experiences from, you know, trauma of some kind in early childhood sets us off, shapes us in a certain way. And so I think psychology, that side of psychology can be useful in terms of allowing us to um, not get so caught up in the things that trigger us mm -hmm. so that we can begin to, yeah, yeah, not be so caught up in it, step back from it, which means we can find ways to make it easier to come back to resting in that inner quiet. Sure. I, uh, I read the, uh, some work by Eric Newman. I think he was, uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, one of Sigmund Freud's lineage and he's he made a profound quote it stuck with me he said something along, along the lines of the end of the 20th century uh, sorry the end of the 19th century into the 20th century was the beginning of the mind turning back on itself to figure itself out again in the western world that is because obviously in the eastern it's very different dynamics and that's stuck with me it's quite profound and it seems the western paradigm has gone more scientific psychological approach that way whereas the eastern is more um well it's been around for thousands of years the yogic culture 
But when yeah. you actually look at the the manifestations of that in the world, you have like a Western world that is, you know, much more capitalist and, and materialist in its approach. You've got the Eastern paradigm, which is far more spiritual, but there's a lot of poverty, a lot more poverty over there in the world. Do you think there's like a balancing act that is potentially trying to level itself out? And that's what was happening at the beginning of the 20th century. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. I think that definitely needs to happen. It's almost like it, in our culture, the Western culture, it's almost like both are going ahead at full speed. We're getting more and more materialistic and attached to our things. And at the same time, there's, I think, a, an increasingly widespread awakening to the the value of a more spiritual approach and many many people exploring that for themselves so the two are the two are sort of there hand in hand um but that's an interesting quote yes i think that it was and that's been the last whatever it is now 100 years or more is mm. the mind beginning to look at itself which you know apart from a few individuals who did that in western culture it wasn't really done mm -hmm. and which is, it had been done in the east a lot i'm not sure that so people trying to say oh, it was because you know the east is always looking at its navel that's why they got so much poverty i think <laughs> i think there are many other factors in that i don't think it's just because the east has been has has been the culture that it's been able to reflect upon itself i don't think that is responsible for the the increased poverty and things that we find there i, th I think there are other other factors right much more you know the history of you know european civilization and dominance of the world and that sort of thing yeah mm, no, that's cool so you had like Sri Ramana Maharshi uh in South India and you a few hundred miles up the road you had uh Sri Aurobindo I'm sure you're aware of above yeah. these, these gentlemen yeah. Yeah. very different approaches in how they sort of I don't like to use the word work but you, you know where I'm yeah. going with with what I'm saying yeah, yeah. um do you have like a, because Sri Aurobindo, I'd like to think of his work as like bringing through high consciousness, God, if you, if you want to use that term, yeah. to, to out in society, whereas Sri Ramana wasn't interested in anything like that. And it was just the individual uh, transcending yeah. life. Do you think there's like um, a right or wrong in that? No, I think there they're complementary perspectives. I mean, Sri Aurobindo, I mean, he was an incredible mind who, mm. you know, his writing, I mean, I've never, you know, I've started some of his books and, you know, slowly got through the third halfway yeah. through, but it's like, it's deep, deep um, insights into the nature of the universe from a con perspective of consciousness, if you like, and how consciousness is working. Whereas Ramana Maharshi is very very simple it's the opposite it's just like you know it's about our own individual awakening which i suppose you could say chiro rabindo is talking about the role of awakening in the universe mm. and ramana Maharshi is saying this is how you do it mm. and his you know, his simple thing was just um well it's often put as the question who am i but that gets misleading because people then start looking for something it's more of an inner inquiry to actually, you know, to look inside and say, what is this thing we call I? And seeing that it's actually a creation of the mind. So he was, he was pointing to a practice that would help us liberate ourselves from the, the false identities we get trapped in. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, so I see, I see them as complementary, not contradictory. They're two different and important discussions. Yeah. You, I think it were you, did you uh, coin the term, was it global brain? Yeah. Yeah. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. That was many years ago. I was just writing about it yesterday, funnily enough. I think it's 40 years on since I was thinking wow. about that. Um, it came out of several things that was going on in my, going on in my life. I, my interest in mathematics, which is you know where we started, led me to do a postgraduate degree in computer science, 
And part of the work I was doing, were, and this was in 1970, we were linking two computers together getting two different computers to talk to each other mm. which was you know the very first networking of computers and i was fascinated where the networking of computers was going and at the same time um the guy hypothesis had had just come out the idea that you know the whole earth functions as a single living system mm. and i was thinking well if that's the case what are human beings doing it you can say you know the oceans are like the circulatory system or whatever, and we can draw lots of parallels. What are human beings doing in the planetary system? You know, the planets work pretty well for billions of years, and here we are, this young upstart, just a couple of million years old. Yeah. What are we doing here? And realizing what we're good at is the information processors. We are, yeah, that's what we are, the information processors on the planet. That's what we're good at. And so seeing the burgeoning networking of computers i mean now we're, we're living in it here we are you know using computers to talk to each other and, and you know talk to the world i saw that as beginning to link the minds of humanity together in the same way that nerve cells in the brain link together and so i was drawing parallels with how the brain evolves in the fetus and how the nerve cells connect with how through computer networking we would be beginning to link ourselves together in the same way so that was the idea of the global brain that computer networks would actually start doing the same same thing but of course then you know all we were doing was sharing data numbers we didn't even have didn't even have text processing back then that was just <laughs> beginning to come let alone you know then the world wide web and streaming and all this you know things we now take totally for granted it's been fascinating over those 40 years mm. watching this come in step by step by step more and more ways of us beginning to link together across the planet mm. and we, we seem to be entering a new phase as well with uh, i don't know if you follow the the world of cryptocurrencies and all that new technology and everything but we seem to be entering a new phase of that internet etheric uh yeah. world as well i don't know if you've if you've been um keeping up with with a lot of it but it's very decentralized now and when you see some of the technologies that are coming on and everything's interlinked with everything else but they own their own data now they're not it's not all spread you know like facebook and things that can harvest all your data it's becoming much more decentralized where you own it but it's there to be spread amongst everybody if you'd like to do that and yeah. it just seems another step up to me yeah yeah no, it is. And something else that I'm fascinated by right at this moment is Clubhouse. I don't oh, know yeah. Familiar with Club. mm. yeah. Because the fact it's audio only, I always feel I connect with people. If I'm having, you know, I, I have some clients I work with, I just like to be on audio because I feel I can really connect with the feeling of a person just by, I can tune into the voice. And what I love about Clubhouse is... It's like it's it's another level of connection, which because it's synchronous in time, Facebook, Twitter, those sorts of things, Instagram, whatever. You know, you put things up, people look at them, and they maybe look at them five minutes later or five days later. A conversation is live at that moment. And so it's like people all over the world can get together and listen to each other and talk in the moment. And I think this is a for me, this is a significant step forward in this, the linking together of minds rather than data. I mean, what you were talking about, I think, was, was you know, data, etc. But in terms of human minds coming together, we can actually, you know, one consciousness talking to another, listening to another live, to me, is a, a significant step. And that's, that's why I was revisiting the global brain, writing about uh, it yesterday, was I just thinking about, okay, yeah, seeing Clubhouse is more than just another social media platform. There's something something more significant about it. Yeah. That's an interesting take, yeah. Um, do you, with the global brain uh, theory there, uh, and you mentioned that you believe the, the Earth to be one system, uh, I tend to agree with that. Do you consider it like a global consciousness everyone's like tuned into it and it creates like an average 
Um, and I suppose yes. let me link let me link that into things like climate change and things like that. How yes. there's a, a lot of destruction in many different areas. Is that due to that collectiveness? Yes, I think there's two there's two senses of collective consciousness. One is in terms, if you like, our collective knowing and understanding that, you know, I can be aware of what's happening to, you know, farming in India or something due to climate change. There's that sort of collective knowing, which wasn't possible before. So we, we all have access to that. But then there's a sort of sense of a collective consciousness. If we come back to the brain parallel, you know, all the, the activity of all the individual neurons in the brain give rise somehow or another to my experience. So I am having a collective experience of all my neural activity. And so I think there is something like that can happen on the, I think it is happening on the planet, it's growing, but it's something which we wouldn't directly participate in or know about it because I don't think a neuron in my brain knows about my consciousness, but it's doing its thing. Mm. That consciousness is then feeding back in, into the brain, and I think creating, um, what's the best word to put it? It's increasing the, the synchronization of what's happening in the brain. So I think as we link together more through, you know, through all the different aspects of the internet, I suspect there's something emerging at a collective level, at a planetary level, which would be akin to what we call consciousness, which would be having some feedback system into us and the world. But now we start getting really speculative. It's fun. And, mm. um, and who knows? I, you know, I sometimes think, you know, synchronicity, those, those unusual coincidences, which we can't explain, but, are, you know, as Jung called them very meaningful mm. coincidences. Is that a sign of some higher order of, yes, some higher order emerging in the collective consciousness, which is somehow feeding back into our own consciousness and leading us to be in situations or recognizing these coincidences? Uh, you could take an analogy here with you know the human body is that you've got the brain you know controlling or looking after the body in some ways making sure you know the blood circulation of the blood at you know salinity level is correct there's all this monitoring going on and would a skin cell you know in your skin say isn't it amazing how the right amount of blood comes along when needed and it's just the right salinity what a fascinating coincidence <laughs> not realizing there's a higher degree of organization happening. I suppose and that's when, the question of intelligent design. So the question of intelligent design. Yeah. Is that, mean, that are you trying to, are you, are you alluding to that? No. Okay. No, I'm not. I'm just, no, um, no, I'm not. I'm just saying that it's not so much intelligent design. It's like intelligent functioning of the system as a whole but not, not the design, but intelligent mm. functioning of the mm. system. Mm. Okay. Fascinating stuff. Um, let's follow that track a little bit to do with uh, the intelligent design route. Uh, I'm not religious in, in, the origin, in, the, in the proper context it's used today, I suppose. Um, yeah. Where do you feel re the role religion plays today do you think it has a big role to play in society or do you think it's morphing into something more evolved ah again not not simple questions or simple answers um there's so much going on i mean it's to some extent religions are getting some religions are getting more fundamentalist in their own way i think they're feeling threatened by what's going on and so they they go back to their sort of deeper belief systems so that's happening i think we can see that in almost all religions through the world that there's a trend there mm. and at the same time there's a trend of people stepping out of religion and saying what what is behind this like what i was describing for myself earlier so i think that's happening at the same time and 
and that to me is the is the good side of it the more we can step back from the doctrines and discover what what is the real truth here then i, I think that that's the valuable side of religion um yeah because that's something that then begins to unite us rather than divide us when we get caught up in a particular system um, and then debating which one is right or wrong we're actually creating division amongst us mm. um, I mean yeah. I think the role of religion with the mythology and everything that is played out through there deeply resonates with our soul somewhat and I think this is why people there's millions of people billions of people across the planet that need religion in yeah. order to feel that sense of meaning and that sense of purpose in life. Yeah. Yeah. You go back to ancient Egypt and we're using the same mythology in modern day Christianity that we were using in ancient Egypt. And it's like, it's it bled all the way through. That's my take yeah. on religion. Yeah. I think so. It, we, we, we look for meaning. And I think it's a fundamental part of being human to look for meaning. And, you know, we can take it right back to, you know, being, you know, whatever it was, you know, pre-civilized creatures where we look, we look for meaning to know when, you know, when is the right time to sow crops, what's happening, this sort of thing. It, it's deep within us to look for meaning. And then as, as I think the world's got more complex, this, this looking for meaning has almost become more important because science doesn't give us meaning. Science tells us what's going on, but science doesn't actually tell us what it means. There's no meaning in science. And so that search for meaning almost becomes more acute in a world that's dominated by scientific understanding. It's like, yes, but, you know, I know, I know there's something else. Is that seeking something else? Mm -hmm. And so when we find some, you know, meaning system, we, we tend to latch onto it because it gives us a sense of safety. So I think that's what me meaning does. It gives us a sense of knowing, of safety, uh, some sort of security in the world, which I think is what its original function was. Yeah. And so it, you know, it feels good to have discovered some sort of system, some sort of meaning. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left, Peter. I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world today in the sense of what people can do, because I do a little bit of uh, coaching and consultancy work, and there's a lot of people out there that are struggling with their mental health and everything. Is there any like tips and guidance that you'd offer to these people who are struggling right now? Yes. Um, let's see. First of all, I think something we touched upon already is just to, to pause your thinking um, as much as you can. I mean, I have little notes I leave around. There's one on my desk here. It says, pause. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, you know, I just leave them around. I had to move them around so I habituate to them. But basically what that says is whatever I'm doing, and it's usually between tasks, I'm getting up to go and make a cup of tea and I see a note, I'll just pause for you know five ten fifteen seconds that's all like notice ah notice how it is to not be caught up in thinking for a while just like ah yes to notice that that greater sense of ease so that you know what you know people experience in deep meditation we're beginning just a little taste of that in the day and i th i think that's really important and it's not just pausing the thinking for a moment but it's noticing it's the important bit for me is noticing how it feels not to be caught up in the next thing to do but just between doing one thing to another it's just, it's just doing that so it's allowing us to basically bring a little more of that ease into our daily life bring more of that peace into our daily life so that that's one thing i suggest because you know we're getting so so many reasons to get anxious stressed concerned all of which is going on in the mind. And so the more we can just step out of that for a moment, pause that anxiety thinking, I think the healthier, the healthier we can be in it. 
and we can gradually learn to to come back to that place and of course you know with that i would suggest longer periods of meditation where you know 10 15 minutes where you just practice just pausing the thinking coming back coming back to yourself coming back to the present moment that sort of thing mm. um on another level something i think is important is you were talking about all you know deep down we're all the same and i think one way in which we're all the same is that we touched upon it you know we all want to feel at ease to feel happy but another way is that we we all want we all want to feel loved i think it's an absolutely fundamental part of being human you know we can take it right back to childhood or whatever but it's there it's a fundamental thing we want to be loved we don't want to feel attacked um criticized we want to feel appreciated what can so easily happen in a relationship whether it's you know personal relationship business relationship or with your neighbors or whatever something happens when I mean, let's take us you you say something to me and i misinterpret it and i feel you were you know attacking or something a bit critical if i'm not really careful i'll probably respond in some way like you know, body language or silence, or I might attack back and say, well, it's all very well for you to say that, but blah, blah, blah. Mm. And you then feel attacked because I was, I was actually, you know, meaning to make you feel bad. And so you get, what happens is two people both looking to feel loved, both wanting to feel loved, actually interacting in a way which says, I'm going to hurt you a little bit. I'm going to withhold my love. I'm just going to dig in a little bit so that you realize the error of your ways and love me better. Mm. And you're doing the same to me. And so we get into a vicious spiral, which is often you don't see it on the surface. Everything looks nice and polite, but underneath there's that little sort of little attacking going on. And the way out of that, which I find very powerful is just to have the intention in whatever interaction you're having with another person to have the intention that whatever you do or say they feel loved and appreciated which means being vigilant to catch those little bits of attack those little bits where you want to dig the needle in a tiny bit and just irritate them just to catch those and not do that and it really makes a difference in a relationship where two people are basically agreeing we're here to help each other feel cared for mm. we're here not to attack and make the other person feel bad and it it really does make a difference yeah, yeah. It really does make a difference so i think that's one thing you know because we're all in relationship with other people and it, as i say it's not just our intimate personal relationships but but any interaction and it's so easy to do you know we get hurt we want to hurt back so it's just like interrupting that, you know, that response. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Beautifully said, yeah. And and I'm going to ask you a question here in closing, and uh, I'd love to hear your answer. You've mentioned okay. that to be, more, to be more loving and everything with people. My question to you, what is love? Great. Um, well, you can find many different meanings for it. What is love? For me, on one level, it's an acceptance of another person as they are. It's that opposite of rejection, criticism, etc. But actually, I think it's part of, you know, I was talking about our true nature. I think our true nature is, I, I use the word lovingness as opposed to love. Because um, love has all these other connotations. But when when my mind is when my mind is quiet and i'm at ease there's an open-heartedness my heart is open to other people to what is and i call that lovingness it's not loving an object i mean that that can come you know i can love another person or love the beauty of a tree but lovingness is just a quality of open-heartedness which can then be applied in the world or that then reflects not so much applied it then reflects how i 
interact with the world, if I'm coming from an open heartedness. And it's the mind that gets closed. I, in some ways, I think the heart is always open. In some ways, it's the mind that gets closed. And so the, the heart cannot shine through. And so when we, you know, when, when we, the mind becomes quieter, and that the closed nature of the mind begins to soften, then that natural open heartedness begins to become more apparent. It, become, it is it is not veiled so much. I think it's veiled by all our thinking and closed mindedness. And so the veil the veil is gently pulled back and the open heartedness can shine through. Beautiful. Peter, thanks. That was a great answer as well. So thanks for joining me. Is there anything that you would like to um, promote? Are you sharing anything? Have you done any more work recently? Um, the one thing is I've just finished a new book, thanks to COVID, gave me this time and space. <laughs> yes. to sit at home and, coming, which is um, called Letting Go of Nothing, with the subtitle Relax Your Mind and Discover the Wonder of Your True Nature, which is a series of essays which is coming out in in august coming out in august but this is a book i've been wanting to write for a long time it's really a summary of my um realizations through my own inner exploration of consciousness so it's a summary it's a summary of that you know some of the things we've been talking about here that mm. sort of thing but ego and other things mm. so yeah that's what i've been working on and now of course it's with the publishers i'm going through all the proof correcting and all that stage yeah but that'll be out in all it's called letting go of nothing and just the the title is you know the joke in the title is what we're letting go of is not things you know we think oh i've got to let go of this relationship or money or whatever what we're letting go of is the clinging, the attachment in the mind. We're letting go of attitudes, judgments, belief systems, which aren't things. Mm. So we're, we're letting go of non-things. Yeah, that, that's the so that's the reason behind the title. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, and your website, uh, peterrussell.com. With Simple. Two hours on that. Yeah, Peter Russell. The French way is one hour, which gets you to someone else's. Um, typo squatting but yeah peter <laughs> russell peter russell with two hours that's my website yeah beautiful yeah. peter thanks for joining me pleasure enjoyed it very much good all the best and you bye-bye